Might be well, I'll do that too. As soon as uh, yours is different. Yeah, we're off mute now. We're off mute now. So. Uh, oh, sorry about that, Dave. If there we go. Yourselves, and we'll go ahead and get started again. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are uh, ecstatic to put a presentation on here for the American Rescue Plan. Um, the Senator has been over the moon uh, thinking about over $677 million being sent to every city, town, county, and municipality all over the state of West Virginia. This is something we haven't ever seen before. This is something that, you know, we always hear there's large numbers and uh, large dollar amounts coming down from the federal government. But many times it doesn't get all the way down to the cities, counties, municipalities, towns, our small communities all over West Virginia that really know what's going on and what parts of West Virginia and what areas need focused on. So I want to thank you all for being interested in, in coming here today. Um, we are honored to have a statement from Senator Manchin today and also a statement from Auditor McCuskey. Um, Senator Manchin and Auditor McCuskey have met many times now and have began working together on making sure this funding gets uh, spent and presented in a way that is transparent, effective, and really in a way that actually is going to move West Virginia forward. So we look forward to hearing from both of those today and, and a few others. Um, before we get started, I, I want to thank all of our regional planning and development councils in West Virginia as we put on over eight of these presentations now all over the state. All of our regional planning and development councils has helped, have helped us in every one of those, and they've really helped us put together uh, this presentation and many other aspects of the information we're gonna put out today. Um, in addition, the uh, West Virginia Press Association, the West Virginia Municipal League, the West Virginia Association of Counties, the County Commissioners Association of West Virginia, um, and the West Virginia Broadcasters Association. So we wanna thank all of them and all of our hosts and everybody that helped us put on these events all over the state. Um, with that, I, I want to introduce and uh, we will hear a brief statement from U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. Hello, I'm United States Senator Joe Manchin. Manchin. I want to thank you for participating in today's funding guidance session for the American Rescue Plan. Thank you to our State Auditor J.B. McCuskey and his staff, the U.S. Department of Treasury, our partners, the Association of Counties, Municipal League, County Commissioners, Broadcasters, and Press Association, and Regional Development Councils, and our hosts for helping with today's guidance session. There is simply no other state holding these sessions to help ensure that we spend this funding the right way to address the most pressing needs of our state. Over a year ago, the first West Virginian was diagnosed with COVID-19. We have spent the last year mourning over 580,000 Americans and over 2,700 West Virginians who lost their lives due to this horrific virus. Our health care providers and frontline workers have worked tirelessly to care for their fellow West Virginians. Our students and teachers have adjusted to new ways of learning, and our small businesses and restaurants closed their doors to protect their communities from COVID-19. This was a challenging year that tested every American, but we are finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Any American or West Virginian who wants a vaccine can get one. Cases are going down, businesses are reopening their doors, and most of our students are back in the classroom. And the American Rescue Plan will help defeat COVID-19 so our communities can recover and we can return to normal. When Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, a COVID-19 relief package aimed to help defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. It set us on the right track for economic recovery. This bill provides $14.2 billion for COVID-19 vaccines, $49 billion for testing and tracing, $8.5 billion for rural health providers, and $7.6 billion for community health centers, ensuring the vaccine continues to be our top priority, and healthcare workers receive the support they deserve. This pandemic also impacted our students, communities, families, and small businesses. West Virginia alone will receive approximately 
$140 million for broadband expansion, $152 million for emergency rental assistance, and $1.3 billion for our schools and child care facilities. Every city, town, village, and county in the state will receive funding to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure and support essential frontline workers. This relief bill will help West Virginia, West Virginians rebuild after this incredibly difficult year. Since the American Rescue Plan was signed into law, we've waited for the Treasury guidelines that you need to ensure this funding provides the opportunities we expect it to. Now you finally have the guardrails and the systems you need to start using these funds. I fought for this funding to go directly to cities and counties because you all have continued to provide critical services throughout the pandemic despite decreased revenues. You are the boots on the ground who know how to best use this funding to protect and improve the lives of those in your community. And if we can't answer your questions today, we'll work to get you an answer so that you can jumpstart the infrastructure that's needed to bring our cities and counties into the 21st century. Many of you have also contacted my office about earmarks. My staffer, Andrew Robinson, is here today to help answer any questions you may have, and our office is always available to answer your questions going forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has tested our entire nation, and through it all, West Virginians have banded together to keep our loved ones safe. The end is within reach, and this COVID-19 relief package is what West Virginia needs to put this pandemic behind us once and for all. I was proud to vote for this relief package, and I look forward to seeing our communities begin to recover. So, thank you again, and God bless you. All right, with that, we are, uh, we, Senator Manchin has been essential in guiding this legislation through Congress and, and has had a large part in molding what it's going to become. Um, the senator had a really a look to the future of what communities are going to be able to do with these funds and opportunities. Um, with that, he, I'm one of the new, my name is Andrew Robinson, and I'm one of the newest members of Senator Manchin staff. Uh, my, I have a technical title of a communication advisor and a external relations specialist. However, Senator Manchin really saw that all of our communities, while this is an opportunity, are going to have some difficulties in working with federal government and trying to make sure that they follow all the guidance uh, exactly correctly to make sure that we don't see recoupment in the future of these funds. So Senator Manchin hired me specifically for right now to work with all of you and make sure I'm a liaison and a resource for all of you to answer any questions or get answered any questions that you may have. Um, as we go forward, I, I hope you'll reach out to me and use me as a resource or anything American Rescue Plan related or any other needs that I can help out with. Um, you'll see that uh, some of the booklets that we handed out at our live events are, are here listed. Um, most of these you should have received as links in the email for the Zoom meeting tonight. Um, if any of these documents are something you'd like an extra copy of or need the link again, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, before we get off to the auditor's information, I wanted to go over a couple things. Um, first being the adjusted funding levels. Some of our larger cities and counties may have seen some adjusted numbers in their actual funding that they received probably last week. Um, this is due to Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers were used to develop the actual amounts that went to each community. And these numbers were based on numbers and estimates from the fall, which have changed a little bit. So now uh, as we await the guidance for our non-entitlement cities, um, those also may change a little bit, but should be pretty close to your estimates. Um, funding mechanisms. Our counties and larger municipalities, um, some of which we've heard have already received their funds, um, are smaller, which they call our non-entitlement cities, our smaller municipalities and communities will receive those directly from the state. The state is required after they receive the funds from the federal, federal government to pass those on within 30 days. So I believe the state has received their, their funds and we should see checks and, uh, and wires going out within the next 30 days to all our non-entitlement cities or smaller communities. Um, matching funds. Matching funds uh, for federal investment are one of the most common questions we've received. And the answer from Treasury that we've received is that they will not be available to be used for matching funds. 
that's an unfortunate case. Um, and Senator Manchin took that one uh, last Friday and has decided that he's going to make a major push to make allowances for some of these funds to be used for state matching dollars um, because he knows just the multiplier effect and the larger projects that we'll be able to get done if they're available for those, those matching funds. Um, the guidance for non-entitlement cities, we expected those last week and haven't seen them yet. So we really expect guidance for the non-entitlement cities plus the actual funding numbers for those non-entitlements to be received any day now. It's probably sometime this week. And as soon as we receive those, we'll disperse those to everybody that signed up for our American Rescue Plan uh, forums, not only tonight, but all over the state. With that, I just want to give you all my contact information. As I said, Senator Manchin has uh, seen my role here as a liaison for you, someone for you to reach out to, to give me a call. If you have anything or any information uh, needed, please just call me directly and, and I'll try to do my best to help you out. Um, as we've gone through these forums, we've, we've had eight of them across the state. Um, Senator Manchin has sent us out to make sure we have all the information uh, we have available. We were lucky enough all last week to have our state auditor, J.B. McCuskey, uh, with us. And today we have a uh, video greeting from Auditor McCuskey, and I'll play that for you right now. Hey, welcome to all of our local government partners, partners uh, be it city or county. Uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there live with you today. Monday evenings are soccer for my six-year-old. And uh, while I do love you all, uh, this is one of the more important things we do during the week. So we decided we would do a video and, uh, and I, I hope you guys have a wonderful session. And, and my staff uh, with Anthony Woods will be on later to discuss uh, in detail what we're talking about and, and to give you guys an update on how our office is working. So let me just let you know that the last uh, few weeks have been uh, really a wonderful opportunity for our office to interact with all of you. Um, it's been great to work with Senator Manchin and his staff. Um, and, and like you all, we are just so grateful that um, he was able in this instance to, um, to draft this legislation in a way that delivers this money directly to our local governments. And the reason that our office is so excited about this is that we work with you all every day and we know that you are the people who will be able to quickly and legally and efficiently spend this money on the infrastructure projects that our state so sorely needs. Uh, and we talk a lot about um, about how the, the state can do a better job of supporting our local governments, and that is what our office is here to do. We are uh, un unveiling a, a, a technology that is going to enable all of you to streamline your reporting, build projects with your neighbors, uh, but most importantly, it is our number one goal to make sure that all of you feel confident in spending this money, that when you spend it, you feel great about the results, and that we are ready to support you in every way you need uh, in, as far as federal reporting is concerned. Uh, accepting this level of federal funding is going to come with a lot of strings and a lot of, uh, a lot of oversight, and our office is fully prepared and ready to make sure that we are uh, the, the one-stop shop for each of you to get your questions answered. So again, thank you all so much for being on the Zoom today. Again, I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there, and please allow our office and Senator Manchin's office to do everything we can to make you successful. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, Otter McCuskey was nice enough to travel with us uh, all week last week to eight venues and eight meetings and give a presentation, answer questions. And uh, along with Otter McCuskey, we had one of his staffers, uh, Anthony Woods, with us as well for most of those. And uh, I believe Anthony has a, a short presentation here to give before we get off to uh, questions and answers. So, Anthony, if you'll unmute yourself, I'll try to work the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation here for you and uh, we'll go forward there. Thanks, Andrew. Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Woods from the Auditor's Office. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been working on here in our office to help you guys be successful in this project. Uh, when, this, when this bill first passed in March, the auditor came to me and said, you have one job this summer, and that is to make sure our local governments have whatever tools they need uh, to be able to simplify their reporting to the Treasury and to be able to make their dollars more effective. So we're going we're gonna to work with you guys to be that one-stop shop, like the auditor said. Um, be here to help answer any questions you might have. And most importantly, help you stretch these dollars out and use them effectively. So we're going to have a, a three-step process for you 
to help you in this endeavor. So the first is an intake form. So we're gonna have an online web portal and we're just gonna ask a couple questions. We're gonna get a point of contact for your entity who will be working with us in this ARP funding and we're gonna have someone in our office working one-on-one -on -one with you to make sure you have your questions answered and that you have everything that you need. Um, we've teamed up with our office's local government services division uh, with this and we're gonna be able to be there as a resource for you. Um, I think one of the things that happened with the CARES Act money is a lot of times there were consultants who might have you know, knocked on your door and, and asked if they could help you with this for a percentage of the funding. And we feel at the auditor's office that you don't need to do that. Um, our office, Senator Manchin's office, we will be your consultants here. Um, we want you to be able to use this money in your community and, and have us as that resource instead of paying someone to do that. So with this intake form, we're gonna have a point of contact. We'll have someone working with you. I'm gonna ask a couple questions about what your priorities might be with this money. Um, the auditor's office is not going to tell you how to spend your money at all. But if we do have an idea of what projects are important to you in the local government communities, uh, we can pair you guys up if there's neighboring communities or neighboring counties and try to find ways to make that money stretch longer in your community and do more projects. So the intake form is just going to ask a few questions. It's about 20 questions, should take maybe a half hour to complete. Um, then we're going to compile that data and see what, what sort of help you're going to need, if any. The second part of this is going to be um, training and reporting. So with this guidance that we received a week or two ago, um, the U.S. Treasury is still coming out with exactly what they want to see with the reporting that's going to be required. Um, we know when the reporting is due, but they didn't give us very many guidelines on what exactly will need to be reported. So we're looking at that and we think it's going to be very similar to the CARES Act reporting that the state did and what they're required to, to send into the Treasury. And what we're going to provide for you is a free accounting system for this American Rescue Plan money. If you go in and you fill out the fields, um, we've kept everything as simple as possible, but our goal is for you to be able to go in and click a couple buttons and have everything you need to complete the treasury reporting on the grant solutions portal and cut down that time. The auditor's office is, we're here to assist you in this endeavor and we feel that if you take your time and you invest in your communities, you're gonna be busy managing these projects and you're gonna be very busy working with your community, helping your constituents, managing the different things that you're gonna be doing. And we feel that your time is probably better spent out there in the community with your citizens, rather than filling out reams and reams of paperwork. So we've got some reporting tools that can kind of put everything in one place and bring everything together to make that treasury reporting easier. With that, we're also gonna give everyone a web portal. This is gonna provide additional reporting capabilities. It's built on the same technology as our open checkbook, but, you, but just know that if you have items that you do not want the public to see, you, do, you can have some private reporting. Uh, what this reporting platform is going to do is it's not going to enable you to run any type of report on the spending data on the fly, um, just not only for your treasury reporting, but it's going to allow you the decision makers of the local governments to really have that ability to see where this money is going and how far along your projects are. So for example, one of the features of this online portal is something called dashboards. And so what that is, is you can configure different metrics. So if you wanna see how many lines of water and sewer you've put in or how many pipes or what your sub grantees are doing, if you're planning on sub granting some of this money out, you'll be able to set up these dashboards and whenever you log into this reporting portal, out with one glance, you'll be able to see how far along you are with, with achieving your goals. Um, with that, this reporting portal also has an interesting feature called stories. So what stories are, they're like interactive web pages. And you can embed text and video and pictures. And you can have these stories uh, face the public. So if you have a project that you think is really exciting in your community, um, you can share that with your constituents and show them how you're making this money benefit you. Um, we're here to help you with this reporting. 
Um, we're here to make this an easy process for you, uh, along with Senator Manchin's office. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, when you get this money, our local government services division is going to ask that you set up a separate special revenue account and a separate bank account. Um, it's probably easier for you if this money is segregated out into its own little pot, and that way all of your disbursements and revenues can go into that account. Um, and if you need assistance with, with how to do that, we can assist you with, with endeavoring that. The second thing I'll tell you is if you are a county or a city that's going to receive your funding directly, if you haven't already applied or received your funding, um, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have a DUNS number. There's no charge to get a DUNS number, but it's a requirement that the Treasury has before that funding can be transferred. Another thing you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have up to date is your SAM registration. Now SAM is the federal government system for award management. And that's also a requirement to receive that funding. If, you've, if you're a county or a city who has received federal funding in the past, then what you, you will likely already have this registration, but you, what you'll want to do is go in and make sure it's up to date because those registrations do lapse and they do expire. Um, so make sure everything's ready for, to go to receive your funding if you're getting it directly. Um, we'll be reaching out through our partners, uh, like Andrew said, the Municipal League, County Commissioners Association, Association of Counties, and we'll be getting that intake form survey link sent to you within the next week. And then we'll be in touch with, if you want this reporting software, how we're going to get that installed and, and working for you. Um, with that, thank you all for being here. Please feel free to reach out to our office if you have any questions and have a wonderful evening. And we're going to make this project a success for West Virginia. Thank you, Anthony. Um, as I said, this is some unprecedented funding. It's something that we haven't seen in our communities and, and the opportunity to spend these funds is great. But as we also discussed, it's going to be a major task to try to follow the guidelines, reporting requirements, and things that the federal government put on. Um, the auditor has been uh, grateful and has been willing to come through and run with us uh, to go through some of the reporting requirements. I believe some of his uh, software and reporting uh, issues are going to go uh, hand in hand with some of Treasury to try to streamline what that process is. Now that process is yet to come and, and Seth Gaynor, our uh, senior policy advisor here with uh, Senator Manchin's office, is going to go through some of that guidance. And before Seth does that, I just wanted to point out that the Senator would like us to pass one that he encourages all of our small towns, communities, cities, counties, everyone to to collaborate and get together, make sure that you're telling your neighboring city or town uh, what project you're working on, see if they could have a part in it. Maybe they could use some of their fundings and funding and grow that to a larger project. And with that said, we would point out that the state will receive $1.355 billion in the same uh, funding stretch. So we would like for you to be sure that you reach out to the state show them their, your project in writing, make sure you pass that on and ask them to be a part of it, to ask them to uh, jump in and, and help you get, if you, if you can't quite get to the full funding number, to try to get to the full funding number with the help of the state or the help of the county or with the help of uh, collaborating with your, your uh, adjacent cities or counties. So with that said, I, I will introduce uh, Seth Gaynor, our senior policy advisor here at Senator Manchin's office. Uh, Seth has a, a wide breadth of knowledge on the U.S. Treasury guidance and, and many other items, but I'll let him go over uh, the process and what he has available and information we have so far. Hi, everyone. I am Senator Manchin's Senior Policy Advisor for Appropriations and Commerce Issues here in Washington, D.C. I'm really happy to be here talking to all of you tonight, and I want you to know that Andrew and our state team and all of us here in D.C., uh, are here to help you work through this process and make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible so that we can really move West Virginia forward with these funds. Uh, so we're here today to provide you with uh, the information that you need to allocate the over $600 million in direct funding to every county, city, and town in West Virginia. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a few things briefly uh, that I think will be helpful for folks uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, the American Rescue Plan that Congress passed earlier this year included $350 billion for states, cities, and counties across the country. 
uh, two weeks ago, uh, Treasury released its interim guidance for the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Uh, so if you have any questions, the first place that I'd recommend looking is on Treasury's website. They've released a couple uh, very helpful documents uh, in understanding how these funds can be used. And I would flag three in particular uh, to look at uh, if you have any questions at first. So first, uh, there's the interim rule itself. It's pretty long, it's 150 pages, uh, but you can look through that and it's got a lot of detail on the sorts of projects that are eligible and, uh, and, and then how to kind of use the funds and, and, and calculate your revenue loss and a lot of other things like that. Um, there's an eight page overview that provides a pretty good snapshot of the program itself. And then finally, I think the actually the, uh, the the most useful uh, document is actually a uh, frequently asked questions document. It's also on the website. It's 18 pages, but it's very good at answering a lot of the questions that you may have. Um, and, and I'll just note, um, just a couple minutes ago, Treasury just released the guidance and allocations for non-entitlement units of local government. Uh, they did so while we were on this call, so we haven't had a chance to take a look at it, but if you go to the Treasury website, uh, it will be there after this presentation. Uh, since we haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I can't really answer any questions, uh, but if you have any questions on that after the presentation, please feel free to reach out to us after and we can answer them as best as we can. Um, so a few other things. Uh, on the allocations Andrew mentioned, um, we did have a bit different allocation for both the state, the counties, uh, and, and cities in the state. Uh, the state's actually going to receive a little bit more than it was estimated. Uh, it was estimated to receive about $1.249 billion. Uh, it will receive uh, $1.355, so pretty significant, significant increase. Uh, the estimates were a bit different uh, than the final allocations for some of our larger cities. But for counties that were pretty much the same and are non entitlement units, uh, the towns, uh, they'll actually get a little bit more um, to basically offset the difference. But for the cities, uh, they were estimated at 160, uh, or sorry, they were estimated at 176, they're going to get 168. Um, our towns were estimated at 153, they're now going to get 162 total. Uh, and then the counties are almost the same, uh, they were estimated to get 347.5. Uh, million and they're going to get 348.1 million. Um, so I, I'll just note that all of these funds uh, will be sent to the state. Uh, the state will receive the funds at the same time as it receives its own. They've already done that. Uh, and then they have a certain amount of time uh, to send those funds out to the county or to the, the towns. Uh, so we're going to stay on them and make sure that they get those to you as soon as possible. Uh, I'll note that the state can also not impose its own, any state cannot impose its own conditions on those funds. Uh, so those are yours to see fit within the guidelines the Treasury is, uh, has laid out. Um, so there's generally six buckets uh, that funds can be used for. I'll go through those really briefly. Um, uh, the first bucket is public health. Uh, so that is intended to support urgent coronavirus response efforts. Uh, to decrease the spread of the virus and uh, bring the pandemic under control. Uh, the second bucket is uh, to address economic impacts caused by coronavirus. And so that it supports economic stabilization activities for both households and businesses. Uh, the third is, disadvantage, is to address disadvantaged communities. Uh, there are lots of parts of the country and the state that have uh, you know, seen a higher uptick in coronavirus and have been disproportionately impacted by both the, uh, the virus itself and the economic uh, impact. Uh, so that those funds can be used to address some of those systemic and uh, systemic public health and economic challenges. Uh, the fourth is replacing lost public sector revenue. So that helps uh, strengthen support for vital public services and help retain jobs. Uh, the fifth is uh, provide uh, premium pay for essential workers, and that's both uh, public uh, employees, public health, uh, public safety, as well as workers that have been uh, kind of working throughout the pandemic uh, because they were deemed essential. Uh, and then finally, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on this a little bit more, uh, is infrastructure, so water, sewer, uh, and broadband. Uh, so on those, uh, water and sewer, uh, those, the eligible projects there track pretty closely. Uh, they, uh, the, the guidance tracks with what's, uh, 
You may be familiar with this as the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. Uh, so the eligible uses for this track with the eligible uses for those programs. Uh, and then on broadband, uh, the funding is intended to be addressed to unserved areas. Uh, Treasury defines that as locations that are lacking 25 download and three upload megabytes per second uh, wireline connection. Uh, the, the guidance encourages recipients to build networks with, to build strong networks uh, with reliable 100 megabyte per second download and 100 megabyte per second symmetrical upload speeds. Although there is flexibility for uh, that in places like West Virginia where costs may be higher uh, and, and prohibit kind of those strong networks uh, because of topography or geography or financial cost. And then finally, the last thing I'll mention, um, the last piece of these funds that we're still waiting on uh, is uh, the $10 billion Critical Capital Projects Fund. Uh, that is intended for broadband infrastructure. We have estimated uh, that the state will receive an additional $138 million for broadband infrastructure through that fund. Uh, Treasury has not released the draft rule on that, so we're still waiting on what the program will look like and some of the guidelines there. But I did want to note that it will be, uh, that will be for uh, and so with that, uh, that's kind of the brief overview of uh, the, the uh, program and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thanks for that, Seth. Uh, as we get into our question and answer, um, if everybody would, if you could raise your hand or just give us some kind of notification in the chat there, um, and then I'll call on you and do my best to uh, moderate the best I can to uh, fire off some tough questions to Seth. So uh, with that, if, if anybody has any questions, uh, just let us know and we'll uh, open it up to your questions. Uh, Mayor Cavalier, Hank Cavalier, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you so very much. I have just a couple of questions and um, one is, can the state require that we spend our funds for projects. Let me explain. The West Virginia Department of Highways funded a project for the city of Smithers in 2017. The project is not finished yet. At the time that it was awarded, we were given a 100% grant, $350,000. I received a call last week from the West Virginia Department of Highways telling me that they have looked it up and since the city of Smithers is getting X dollars from this bill, they would no longer pay the $70,000 and we would have to pay it. And I have found out since that there are several mayors in West Virginia that got those same calls. So that's question one. and. Um, I have a second question, if I may. So the first, the, the answer to the first question is the state cannot tell you how to use your funds. Uh, I think we should probably have a conversation uh, after this about whether the state is trying to influence you and how to pay those funds. So um, yeah, happy to follow up offline on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is, when uh, the state was managing the CARES Act, the rules constantly changed on what we could spend the money for and what we couldn't spend the money for. Or they would do things like tell us we could spend the money to buy video equipment for virtual um, communications, but they, they wouldn't pay for the installation with CARES hmm. Act funds. So I'm hoping that by giving the funds to the state and then they have to immediately forward those funds to us, that we will not have to go through those hoops this time. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, so without getting into the specifics of some of those requests, um, Part of that was uh, presumably the interpretation of the state on what it could and could not use for. And I, I know there was a lot of frustration about the CARES Act, both at the state and the local level, 
you know, the, the guidance did change considerably over time. Uh, that led to a lot of confusion. Uh, our understanding is that that is not going to be the case here. Uh, Treasury has really tried to get as much input from, uh, you know, local communities and counties and states at the front end uh, so that they have one piece of guidance and that they are uh, kind of sticking to that. Now, one, one thing I'll note is that right now this is uh, what's called a draft uh, guidance. It's the interim guidance. Uh, so it's not set in stone right now. Uh, what I would recommend is that if you do have some questions or anything like that, uh, you know, Treasury is soliciting input from local communities right now on, uh, you know, how they should distribute or how they, what funds should be used for. Um, so I would recommend, you know, appealing directly to Treasury and saying, hey, we would like to, if we don't, this is not clear in the guidance, we want to use the funds for this. Uh, you know, I think that is, um, I think that would be welcomed by Treasury and we're happy to work with you and to make sure that your voice is heard uh, and that you can get that in with the public comment. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Seth, we have a question from Holly. Uh, does this money need to be used as prevailing wage on projects? Prevailing wage on projects. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on that, Holly? I'll follow up with uh, Holly, uh, Seth, and we'll, we'll try so, to keep going to questions. Anybody so else generally, has questions? Andrew, I will say just generally, uh, Treasury does uh, encourage recipients to use strong labor standards. Um, so that includes labor agreements and community benefits agreements that offer wages at or above uh, prevailing wage and include kind of local hire provisions. Um, so they, they do certainly encourage that to, to take place. Okay, uh, this is a follow-up to that, but uh, does uh, Dave, the Davis-Bacon Act uh, apply? I believe so. Um, I will have to get back to you on that. I, I believe it does. Um, trying to find that to just confirm. Um, okay. Yeah, let's get back to you. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. We have a, uh, a hand raised from the town of Hamilton. So if uh, you'll... Uh, unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hi, my name is Lisa and I'm the clerk for the town. And we are an extremely small town and the infrastructure, we are wondering because we are in desperate need of getting our roads paved. We've reached out to the state and unfortunately they're not able to help. And as of right now, if this 90,000 that we're supposed to be getting can only be used for the water, sewage, and broadband for our infrastructure because we don't have any employees. Our money's gonna be like wasted. It's just gonna be out there in limbo. So my question, I guess, would be, can it be used to pave the roads since roads and bridges is considered infrastructure? So in limited cases, yes. Um, I think what you'd have to determine is whether you've had a reduction in revenues as a result of coronavirus. So if you've had a reduction in revenues, generally uh, the, the interim rule does give recipients broad latitude to use the funds for the provision of what they call government services uh, to the extent of that reduction in revenue. Uh, so uh, government, and government services are very broad and they can include uh, maintenance of infrastructure, uh, pay go spending for building new infrastructure, including roads. Uh, so they would be eligible if you have had a reduction in revenue. If you have not, then you can only use the funds for water, sewer, and broadband. Okay, now another question still pertaining to the roads. There's four roads that um, 911 has brought to our attention that they're afraid to access, but they will, but it, um, they really don't want to because they're in that bad of shape. <laughs> and, and like I said, we don't have any employees, so we're just kind of swinging right. by. 
details here. Well, like I said, I think the, I think the clearest answer is that if you've had, if you can show that you've had a reduction in revenues, you can use that to the extent of whatever that reduction is. Um, I think anything beyond that, um, like I said, you may you may want to uh, kind of send something to Treasury to uh, to encourage them to broaden that um, broaden that. Okay, and will this be? Uh, sorry, did you take up. No, no, no. But will I see it's being recorded? And I had to get on my phone almost at the end of this to be able to hear, see, or anything because it was just all jumbled and everything. Will I be able to ex access this full um, conference somehow? I'm going to defer to Andrew on that one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Marcus has, uh, and you probably can't see it from your phone, but Marcus has already shared the uh, link to the, the where it'll be on YouTube later on. And uh, whenever we finish this, we will send out an email with some of the documents, links, and a uh, link to the video as well. So we'll have that to you by email um, sometime this evening. All right. Thank you. So our, our next question is from Valerie. Uh, it goes with broadband spending. And does the Treasury expect cities to get into the broadband business or will cities be able to give grants to our local broadband providers for them to build out? You'll be able to give grants to your local providers, absolutely. Okay. Um, Barbara Fleshauer, Delegate Fleshauer, uh, when we were talking about non-entitlement spending, what is the distinction important for? Yeah, I should have I should have clarified that. That is kind of a uh, little bit of a term of art within what's called the uh, Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, so the, it, this gets a little bit into the weeds, but basically the funding mechanism that was used to distribute funds to, uh, to distribute the formula uh, to uh, towns and cities and counties uh, was through the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development's uh, CDBG grant program. Uh, that they kind of use that formula. And so the way that that formula works is it has what's called kind of entitlement and non-entitlement communities. Generally, the, way, the best way to think about it is that entitlement communities are big towns and big cities and non-entitlement communities are not. So in West Virginia, we have, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine entitlement communities, and those would be the ones you'd expect. Beckley, Carlston, Huntington, Martinsburg, Morgantown, Parkersburg, Vienna, Weirton, and Wheeling. Those are the nine entitlement communities uh, in West Virginia. Everything else, every other community in the, in the state is what's called a non-entitlement community. Um, and so that's the data that was just released tonight was uh, for, you know, the, the allocations for everyone from you know, Fairmont to Elkins to, uh, you know, let Williamson to Welch. Um, so it's kind of everybody else that's outside of that, the largest nine cities. Um, that's what we, that's what was released tonight. Does that answer the question, Barbara? We'll let her follow up. Um, we have a couple more. Uh, Force account labor, is force account labor allowed if we use our own personnel for infrastructure projects? We've had this question before. The, the guidance doesn't really spell that out. Um, so that's one thing that, that I think, um, like I said, I, you know, my recommendation would be to um, kind of weigh in with Treasury yourself. Uh, and again, we're happy to kind of help work with you to make sure that that happens. Um, I think that one's more of a statement regarding the RDOF program and the uh, broadband. Ar uh, RDOF? Where is uh, that? Uh, I believe this is the broadband reverse auction, but uh, uh, Here, Gene, me... if you'll send us some more information so we can uh, answer your question there, just uh, shoot it over to us and we'll, I'll get the question to set. Andrew, where is that in the chat? I, I believe that's a, a direct question to me. I believe it's a oh. Gene sent it directly to me. So uh, <laughs> I can, it's, it looks like it's a statement, but Gene, if uh, I'm missing the question there, just send it back to me and I'll, I'll get it to set. Uh, Ms. Rivard, the Treasury guidance encourages public participation in the planning process, et cetera. What resources will you provide to help them to reach out? Will you consider a webpage or whatever for an exchange of ideas? Um, I, 
Betty, I will uh, go ahead and point you to uh, that. That's kind of what my role is uh, for Senator Manchin's office is try to be a liaison for uh, Seth and the uh, legislative team in DC uh, as they work with Treasury uh, here on the state level. We're going to try to do our best to be liaisons for those of us on the ground uh, and those of us here in state to try to get it to DC and, and let Seth and them uh, format it and and be ready to uh, explain to Treasury what problems or issues we're facing. So. Uh, really, just uh, give me a call, Betty. I'll, I'll be happy to pass on any information you have. Um, I we have one for Anthony Woods. If uh, the auditor's office is still on there, Anthony, uh, when you were referring to the special revenue account that needs set up, that means creating a separate fund, right? And uh, we'll give Anthony a couple minutes to see if we still have him on. Still on. Okay. Yes, so, so what that means is there will be a separate fund set up in your ledger for this funding and also a separate account. And so that way everything is set aside and it's uh, segregated. So it'll be a separate fund in your ledger and it'll be a separate account. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, we have uh, from Holly, does lost revenue of 1% sales tax count? Um, Holly, we might need a little more information on that question. Uh, Seth, I'll, I'll throw it to you if, you, if you're able to uh, answer that. But Holly, I think we might need a little more information on that. Generally, question. the answer is yes. Um, so general, so basically the, the, the way that the interim final rule approaches this is they uh, kind of adopt a g definition of general, general revenue. Uh, that is similar to the Census Bureau's concept of general revenue from own sources. If you're familiar with that, um, and if you've had to participate in that process, uh, you may be familiar with it. But generally, that includes revenue from taxes, current charges, miscellaneous uh, revenue. It excludes refunds, other correcting transactions, proceeds from issuance of debt or the sale of investments, agency or private trust transactions, and uh, revenue generated by uh, utilities and insurance trusts. Um, so that generally, I think, includes a 1% sales tax, but please feel free to kind of provide some more information to us. In the okay, our, our next one is, uh, is there any guidance being given to the county commissions for any distribution to the public service districts? That is, um, hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think there's any specific guidance that is being given to, uh, you know, the county and the state uh, for that. Um, but obviously, the, you know, the state, it, that is an eligible expense for funds. I mean, generally, I would think that, you know, given the amount of funds, it would probably be coming from the state, although it would be an eligible expense from others. Um, if there are specific things that you'd like us to, you know, point out to Treasury, you know, happy to do that. And on the next one, we have a question about the $138 million uh, for broadband provided to the state. Um, I, I'll clarify before you get started uh, to uh, David here, Seth. Uh, the state will receive $138 million uh, directed towards broadband. However, that's on top of their 1.355 billion uh, and in addition to the 677 million going directly to cities, counties, and uh, other municipalities. Uh, so there's an opportunity for a larger amount to be there uh, for those cities and municipalities and counties to spend on broadband as well. But that 138 is, is specifically earmarked. Um, the question, uh, Seth, is, Will there be any guidance on how communities can give grant funds to local private service providers? There will be guidance. We're still waiting on it. Um, so it's not clear yet whether that uh, that will kind of follow a uh, kind of similar guidance to uh, what the Treasury has already released for broadband infrastructure within uh, the state and local funds. Um, I imagine it's going to be similar, but we just don't have any real information on that yet. Um, like I said, I, I think we're hopeful that that should come soon, um, sometime over the next few weeks. Okay, is that, Seth. Is that helpful? 
the yes, way for I asked that question. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that's perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. We have uh, uh, Gary Michael. Uh, is there a timeline for spending the money or completing the project? It depends on the type of project, but generally, Andrew, I know you've answered this question before, so I'm going to kick that back to you uh, because I think you have the dates more memorized than I do. <laughs> we have uh, in, in the legislation, it allows for uh, a commitment of the funds to December 31st, 2024 and expenditure of the funds to December right. 31st, 2026. So you actually have uh, six years to spend the funds, uh, but you have to have them committed before that date in 2024. Yeah, um, see, I knew, I knew you had that memorized. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Uh, Terrell Ellis, uh, can cities and counties extend water and sewer to economic development sites? Yeah. I mean, that that would be an eligible use of those funds. Um, you know, I, I know the question is kind of similar to uh, EDA. I will also note, uh, Terrell, that the EDA is receiving, I think it was $3 billion in this bill um, for, uh, for additional funds uh, for those purposes. Uh, so, Cities can use it for those purposes, but there are also EDA funds that will be eligible for that use as well. Um, and then generally, like I said, um, you know, the, the eligible projects can be, um, you know, decentralized wastewater, stormwater, water conservation, watershed pilot projects, uh, you know, treatment, transmission, source, storage, consolidation, creation of new systems. So the pretty expansive definition of, of what sort of water and sewer projects are eligible. Uh, and like I said, especially because I know that you have worked with the EDA in the past, um, you'll definitely want to look out for those funds as well. Okay, uh, we have another one from uh, Delegate Fleshauer. Uh, can you share limitations or criteria on the 1.3 billion in state spending? Uh, can you elaborate on that, Barbara? Uh, I think she's she uh, only texting. I think she's texting here, but I believe she's asking on what restrictions they have on uh, the funds going straight to the state. So the same restrictions as everyone else. Okay. Uh, you know, so the, the same buckets that I mentioned, uh, you know, the same, the same guidance, those are the same uh, restrictions and eligible uses uh, for state funds as well. Part okay. of also was um, what should we be thinking about in terms of collaborating with city and county governments? I mean, because we're, we're likely to have a special session in June and it's just going to be slapped in front of us and there will some people that will have a lot of knowledge and some people that won't have a lot of knowledge and I would put me in the latter category. And so I just want to know uh, what, what should we be thinking about to make sure that we're helping our communities? Uh, so I think first off, I would note that, you know, counties, towns, the state can partner together with funds to, uh, you know, stretch those dollars further. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to work to make sure or to push Treasury to be as flexible as possible with uh, local match requirements, but certainly another way to ensure that you know, these projects kind of are able to really get the most bang for their buck is, is to be able to partner together on these. And so that's something that I would recommend thinking about. Um, you know, I would also just suggest, you know, if you're, if you're starting to think of some of these things, please reach out to Andrew and I, and, and we're happy to have kind of additional conversations as, as you start to think through uh, how to best use those funds. And Doug of Pleshar, we've encouraged uh, a lot of, as we've traveled around the state, we've encouraged uh, counties and uh, some of the larger entities uh, to communicate with the small towns and the cities within that county. So I would say that the same thing is, is to use to, to make sure you're ready, when, uh, at least to know the, the projects that are going on in your area um, that those cities and towns plan on using those funds for. And that, that's probably the best prepared you could be, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, we have one from uh, Miss Eileen. Johnson, uh, can funds be used to refund, refund uh, County Economic Development Authority's infrastructure revolving loan program? Hmm. 
I'd have to know a little bit more specifics about that. Um, generally, it is not intended to make debt payments, but that's not really the the issue there. Yeah, I, that's one I think I'm going to need a little bit more specifics on that before I can really and, answer. And uh, Eileen and everyone Good else, question. If, if there's questions that uh, we don't clearly uh, uh, we aren't clearly able to answer if we can elaborate a little more uh feel free to email myself and uh we'll we'll get with seth and try to get a, a solid answer uh as, as best we can back to you okay um we have another one from gary michael can the city put this money on an interest account till the money is spent hmm. i that's an excellent question that's another one i do not believe is addressed in the uh in the guidance um yeah i think that's one where i you know i i think that's one where i would i understand the the thought process behind that um i think it i will note that it can't be put in an interest account and only used for that purpose um i think whether it could be put in that account prior to 2024 uh, you know, that's not addressed in the guidance. So that, that's one where, you know, if you'd like us to, uh, you know, happy to work with you to make sure that that is something that, uh, you know. Okay, from uh, Robin, can some of the money be used for vehicles, equipment, vehicles or equipment to maintain sewage projects? Uh, so that is a, that is another one that is not addressed in the guidance. Um, you know, that is something that we've heard from a fair amount of folks on. Um, generally, uh, as far as I understand, the answer is no, um, but happy to kind of look into that more um, to, to get a better answer. I, I will admit that I am not in, you know, super familiar with the EPA and both the clean water and uh, state drinking uh, state drinking water revolving funds. Uh, you know, Phil Hancock on our staff is really our expert on water issues. Uh, so we can certainly kind of circle back with him and make sure you get that answer. Okay, from uh, Mark Spickler, the state of West Virginia allowed and encouraged payroll reimbursement for police, fire, sanitation for all under CARES Act, even if already budgeted because their scope of work changed. Is this the same for the American Rescue Plan? So I believe if it, so generally, if things were eligible under the CARES Act, they're eligible under this. Okay. Um, it looks like we've hit the bottom of our questions. I, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, we'll give you a couple, uh, a few more minutes just to uh, see if, make sure we got everything. Um, I will thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Seth, for answering the questions. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you to the auditor's office. Uh, of course, all the hosts and sponsors that we've had all over the state. Um, we just really appreciate all of your help. We've uh, done our best to try to put out some information that is available to you. And, and the Senator is very excited to see uh, what you all are able to do with these funds, what opportunities you are able to, to grow. Um, I'm getting a couple other questions now that I was rolling into the conclusion. So we'll We'll get back to those. Uh, Carrie Lewis, are budget requirements to fire departments allowed? Uh, uh, Carrie, I don't know if you're able to elaborate on that or not, but uh, it'd be great to get a little bit more specific on your question. And uh, again, if, if we have any questions that we missed or we didn't get to, um, we we're happy to answer those by email or anything else. Uh, I believe there's an iPhone user that has their hand raised. Uh, I, I don't see their name, um, but if you have your hand raised on the iPhone, we'll, we'll jump to you real quickly. Hi, good evening. Um, I am with the, I'm the manager of a public service district and because we are considered nonprofit, we have kind of been left behind through all the past money that's been distributed. So I'm really hoping that the county commissions will um, take like the public service districts because we need funding to you know, help as well. Um, is, are we eligible for these funds since we are considered nonprofit? I believe so, yes. Okay, so this in turn would need to be addressed with my um, county commissioners since they're gonna be the one just allocating this money. Yeah, as well as the state uh, or uh, you know, cities and 
I mean, basically anyone that's receiving funds directly, uh, you know, would be able to, uh, this would be an eligible use for them now. Great. Okay, thank you. No problem. And uh, Carrie Lewis, uh, that she expanded a little bit on the, our budget requirements to fire departments allowed. Uh, and she added for the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Carrie, I apologize. I still don't fully understand the question. <laughs> and, and Carrie, I'll add my contact information and you'll probably receive an email from me with a, a link to the video and that information. So you can always respond and uh, get back to us uh, by email. Um, as uh, Ryan Thorne, our economic development uh, director, has, has pointed out, we encourage you to work with your regional planning and development councils as you go on these projects. Um, they, they are well aware of uh, the more broader regional projects that are going on and, and can be very helpful in, uh, in collaboration. And uh, they've worked well with us as we've gone around the state and uh, presented this information over the last two weeks. Um, with that, I, on behalf of Center Mansions team, I, I wanna thank you all. Um, again, thank you to uh, the auditor's office and all of our sponsors. Uh, and we really appreciate you all joining us tonight. And if we can be of any more help, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you all and you have a good night. Thanks everyone.